Good evening. Um, you've got a guest lecture tonight. My name is Cherry Fearing, um, and I'm actually the director of the EMS education at Iowa Western. I take care primarily of the paramedic department, but I get a chance to be here with you guys tonight, and so I'm pretty excited about that. We're going to talk real briefly um, about your chapter covering lifespan development. Lifespan development um, is pretty um, critical to your ability to be able to take care of patients and meet them where they're at. Um, and there is a great span from the time a person is born until they die, the changes that the body goes through. So this chapter is going to just address some of those changes and get you better prepared to um, make a good assessment and realize what's normal about a patient and maybe what's abnormal. Okay, if I can get my PowerPoint to go. Okay, so our first stage in our lifespan development is, is what we call infancy. Nothing rocket science about that. Um, basically, that identifies a person in the first year of life. So from the time they're born until they're one year old, we're going to call those patients infants. And, you know, if you've been around kids at all, you know from the time they're born when they are so absolutely tiny and completely dependent upon us, until they're a year old, they do go through some pretty ginormous changes and although they still look cute and they're little uh, they're like a baby uh, they go from not being able to hold their head up to running all around the room uh, not being able to eat by themselves to being able to feed themselves almost completely so um, big changes that go on here physiologically um, babies at birth you know and, and these are numbers that are going to vary regarding what you read but on average six and a half to seven and a half pounds okay by the time they're six months old their weight should double and by their time they're a year old their weight should triple okay um, interesting thing about babies is their head accounts for about 25 percent of their total body weight so if you have ever been to a doctor uh, well baby check or the emergency room or whatever you'll notice that they always measure their heads and that's because it's a very easy way to tell if they are in the normal range and if they're growing, if they're progressing, because the head is such a big part of their body. Um, that's a very good way to tell if they're growing. Other things um, about babies, and I think we're going to talk about some of these as we go on, but their airway is much different than in adults. Um, a child's airway starts out relatively big in their in their oral airway and their uh, nasal airway. And we'll talk about these as we get into um, the airway section a little bit farther. But as it goes down and gets close to the vocal cords, it narrows. So it's kind of cone-shaped. And that's why babies choke on things a lot. They can swallow it easily. They can get it in their mouth very easily. But it gets stuck when they... Uh, suck it down in the airway and it actually gets lodged in there pretty easily. The other thing about a child's airway, if you feel your um, throat, you can feel your airway in there. It's called your trachea. And it feels like kind of like a vacuum cleaner hose. There's little cartilage rings that go around your trachea to keep it from collapsing. A baby's airway does not have that. So if you hyperextend or put their head back too far, you can actually collapse that airway, much like if you take a drinking straw out of a soft drink and bend it, it will eventually just crease over and completely obstruct. You can't suck through it because it's all folded over. Same thing with the baby's airway. They cannot breathe through it if it's uh, hyperextended. Um, other thing is that if reaching across it or pushing down on the front part of the throat at all can easily collapse that airway. So we do have to be careful with our babies' airways. Um, babies are primarily what we call obligatory nose breathers. It means they know how to breathe out of their nose. That's all they know how to do. So if their nose gets full of boogers, they can't breathe. And they get short of breath and they try really hard to breathe through that but they don't have the ability to switch to breathing through their nose. So a lot of times you may get called for a child that's short of breath and um, you just 
grab a warm rag, a wet rag, or the booger sucker and clean their nasal passages out. You may fix it just by doing that. Um, antibodies are passed from mother to child in pregnancy. So they are born with a fairly high immune system. And they keep that for a few weeks. Now, if they're breastfeeding babies, uh, they'll keep it a little bit longer because those antibodies continue to be passed through. And then they're going to reach a time when those antibodies take a dip, and that's when they become at risk for things like RSV and, and uh, viruses like that. Okay. Um, their moral reflex, or that reflex that they get when they're startled, um, if you ever watch a baby, they fling their arms out, their fingers get great big, and they grab onto anything that they can get a hold of. Um, babies are born with two eccentric fears. Okay, One of them is the fear of loud noises that will scare them, and the other one is the fear of falling. Everything else that we learn to be afraid of in life is just that. It's taught to us by our environment. Um, but those two things, loud noises and falling, will scare a baby and they will instantly reach out. So if they do that, you know that's normal. Um, if you get a, a baby that does not have that reflex, something's wrong. And generally it's that they're a little bit um, unresponsive or not, not as responsive as they should be. And so um, that's one thing we want to find out. The big thing that you're going to find out about kids, and as we go through this, is that they change drastically. Kids meaning we're going from birth to age 18. Uh, some categories even take us from birth to age 21. Those are huge changes because there's nothing about an 18-year-old that resembles an infant. And all of these stages that we're going to talk about have different characteristics and different th things that we call a baseline or what we would call normal. Now, for you guys as EMTs and for myself being a paramedic, if I can't recognize what's normal about my patient, I will never be able to recognize what's abnormal or what's wrong. So understanding the normals is huge. And I know this seems like kind of a dumb chapter, but you're going to find that you're going to use this information more than you ever thought. The other thing I would encourage you would be to get a cheat sheet or some type of uh, flip card or um, you could even print something up and, and have it laminated quickly um, or some type of field guide that's going to give you a resource to go to if you're taking care of a one-year-old that you can flip to and see what is the normal respiratory rate, heart rate, blood pressure for a one-year-old. Because I can tell you as a paramedic, I don't take care of enough kids of every age to be good at that. I've a, I'm a mom. I have two kids. I have nine grandkids. I have been around kids all my life. I've babysat forever. And I still go to my resource because I don't absolutely know what the normal respiratory rate for this particular age group is because that's not something we normally do is see how fast this kid's breathing even if we're around kids all the time that's not something we're really familiar with so these things are normal for an infant okay that startling reflex the other one is the palmer reflex um, if you put something in their hand they grab a hold of it okay and then particularly with younger kids um, uh, especially breastfeeding babies, they get that rooting reflex. Um, so if you hold them up to you and hold them up to your chest and they're hungry, they're going to turn towards the side of their head that is touching your body for hunger. So the same thing uh, follows through if you are assessing a patient. If you touch one side of their head, an infant, they should turn towards that side that you touch. Okay. Other things are sucking reflex when you touch their lips. Um, if they're hungry especially, they should uh, start to suck just a little bit. Um, sleeping patterns. If you've been a parent, um, know that in the beginning you don't get a whole lot of sleep. Uh, they may wake up every two to three, four hours to be hungry throughout the night. 
after um, three, four months, two, three months, that should start to regulate and they should actually start to um, sleep through the night. So their extremities grow through um, a process of the bones elongating and becoming bigger and stronger. And so when you deal with children that have possible fractures, they're going to be very concerned if those fractures happened uh, in the growth plate. That's going to be the one you hear the most of. Because if it uh, fractures that growth plate, that's going to inhibit that bone from being able to elongate further as the child grows, which can be a big issue. Um, so you'll hear that. It's not really anything that we're going to be doing or we're not going to be taking x-rays or casting or splinting um, those particular types of fractures after surgery. So um, just know that those are there and they are a big concern if there is a fracture there. Other things with babies that we have to really think about, um, if you've had a chance to be around an infant, they have what they call soft spots in their head. And basically, the skull is made of several plates. And those plates actually squish together and overlap one another as the child is coming down through the birth canal under very confined, face, confined spaces. Um, and the ability for these plates to shift and move a little bit assists with that baby's head being able to deliver. Um, when you have a newborn baby, those plates have not yet welded themselves together, okay, or, um, and you're going to have places in between that will be soft spots, and if you touch them, you don't want to push heavy on them, but if you touch them, you can feel that there is no skull under there, so we've got to be very gentle with those. Um, they come in handy when we're looking at our child to tell if they're dehydrated or not. If those, we call those fontanelles. Um, if the fontanelles or those soft spots are indented, then that child is probably dehydrated or hypovolemic, um, has, has had some blood loss. If those fontanelles are bulging out above the skull, um, then that child has got increased pressure in the in the brain and that should be of concern to us so oftentimes you can see actually see a pulse in those fontanelles if they're bulging a little bit so we just need to make sure that we handle those very gently and when you're looking at a baby to assess them take a quick look at it it will tell you a lot um, now the posterior the back soft spot which is kind of on the top of the head will close in two or three months um, the front one is between 9 and 18 months. Um, I have a 15-year-old set of twin granddaughters. Uh, one of the granddaughters, um, they're not identical, but one of those, both fontanelles were closed, oh gosh, eight months or so, and they were born about six weeks early. The second one is uh, 15 months old, and her front fontanelle still is not yet closed, not even close. It's still rather big. Okay, and again, sunken fontanelles indicate dehydration. Bulging ones in indicate that increased pressure inside the skull, which can be a result of a, a head injury, brain injury, or something like that. Okay, so if you know um, a lot about babies, you know, you know, there's a period of time they really don't care who's holding them as long as they're being held. They don't really identify. I, I think they know mom because they recognize her sound from being in utero for so long, and possibly dad too, just from being around. Um, but really, as long as you're treating them gently and they are fed and warm and dry, they're happy campers. Okay? Um, and then as they go through their learning process for that first year, they learn to bond to certain people. Uh, they learn to trust you. If, if you develop a trusting relationship with them, or they also learn to, to mistrust you if, if you're the type of person. Um, my ex-husband had a very loud, booming voice, and for some reason when he talked to kids, he talked loudly, and he terrified kids. So he had a very hard time developing that bonding, that trusting bond with them, because 
not that he was mean to them, he wasn't, but his voice, remember what I said, they're afraid of loud noises, so his voice scared them, and that eliminated the ability for them to ever learn to trust them. So we kind of want to watch the relationship that these kids have with their caretakers, and as you know, that we are mandatory reporters, so we've got to keep our eye out always for kids that are abused or mistreated. So scaffolding is building one upon another, uh, taking one skill, using it to build another skill. Um, and then our kids, you know, in this first year of infancy, develop a temperament. We've got some kids that right off the bat are very placent and complacent and very... Uh, easy going and you've got other kids that simply are not and that's just their personalities are starting to develop right from the very beginning okay. next phase is the toddler phase and this is um, 12 to 36 months so this is a pretty big stage and I'm telling you a lot happens in this stage okay so here's our one-year-old infant okay kind of learning to walk maybe walking a little bit um, but very much starting into that inquisitive curiosity stage and so this is when kids start to climb they start to put everything in their mouth uh, it gets to be exciting and a little dangerous okay so they are developing more um, stabilized pulmonary systems so their breathing becomes a little better their airway becomes a little wider um, they start to develop those cartilage rings around their trachea, so it becomes a little more protected. Their nervous system starts to become a little more developed, and they learn, um, you know, if it's hot, they pull back. Uh, their musculoskeletal system, their muscles and the bones are getting stronger. The muscles are getting stronger. They're learning to coordinate the muscles with the nervous system and to... Uh, develop those initially it's those gross motor skills you know they're learning to hold stuff they're learning to throw stuff a lot of stuff right off their high chair um, they're starting to learn to understand when they do something like they throw something off the high chair and it bangs loudly on the floor they start very quickly to associate that this action produces this result okay. Uh, their immune system starts to stand on its own. It's not relying on mom's antibodies anymore. Um, and depending on what they are exposed to, their immune system can develop and become much stronger. Um, we used to um, take our kids out. If the neighbors had chicken pox, you ran your kids right over to get them uh, exposed right away so they wouldn't have chicken pox when they were older and make them very, very sick. Um, we've kind of replaced that theory with vaccines, um, and however you feel about vac vaccines is um, is your own personal opinion. But um, vaccines are kind of coming down the way. The other thing they're starting to do is they're starting to get teeth, and a lot of teeth, and a lot of molars, and that can make kids really sick. Um, teeth in general kind of cause a low-grade fever, fussiness, irritability, diarrhea a lot of the times as they start to try and pop those molars for, through that becomes really an issue and some kids can get really really sick with those teeth and it seems to mom and dad because the kids are acting differently than they've ever acted that something is really really wrong and we have to go with that until we can prove otherwise okay so as I was talking about they begin to understand cause and effect um, about 18 months, it's been proven that kids understand consequences. So if you s smack their hand, you know, uh, because they touched something they weren't supposed to talk to, they, they can understand why. Um, they start to develop separation anxiety. Um, mom leaves, they cry, it's a horrible thing. Uh, and then mom comes to pick up from the babysitter and they cry because they have to leave the babysitter. Um, but they're starting to build relationships with people and become uh, very anxious. Sometimes, you know, to the point if you leave with a sitter that it's really an ordeal. And some stages will be worse than others. Um, they do start to develop their imagination and they start play acting and they start 
learning to entertain themselves a little bit during this phase. Hey, and there's a kid. Give him a hose. He's happy for the rest of the day. Okay. Next stage is preschool age, and this is kind of when they start into preschool, obviously, so three to five years old. You can see how far we've come from that first picture of an infant. Um, these kids are able to uh, do a lot of things for themselves. Their body systems are continue to develop, so they're starting to develop those fine motor skills. They're learning to write. They're learning to put puzzles together, take things apart, put them back together, um, and use those finer motor skills that they didn't have before. They're starting to develop social skills, so they're developing friends. Um, they're liking their friends. They're fighting with their friends. They are... Um, learning how to manipulate a little bit. They're learning how they're taking that consequence thing that they've learned and learning how to use that in a social aspect. Six to 12 years old. Those are our school age kids. And obviously this is the elementary age kids, but look how adventurous they have become. Okay? They're starting to lose teeth, um, which isn't a bad thing by any means. Uh, it's a good thing it opens up the uh, airway, but one thing, or not the airway, but the um, oral airway for more adult permanent teeth to come in. One thing this does open up for is uh, some oral decay, oral infection, so we can watch there for those. Um, they generally need less supervision than they did when they were younger, and I say this kind of tongue-in-cheek. Uh, sometimes these kids actually need a whole lot more supervision than they did when they were little because they have brains and they're thinking of things that they can do to get into trouble. Uh, but overall, you can leave them, like you could put them in the bathtub and trust that they don't aren't going to drown on their own accord. Um, they're starting to develop decision-making skills. So you can give these kids, when you're taking care of them, uh, you can bargain with them a little bit if they're a little bit afraid to go with you or afraid to let you take a blood pressure. Um, you can let them try and take one on you, and then you take one on them. Uh, you can give them a choice between this and this. Both of them are things you want them to do, but as long as they think they're making a choice, gives them a little bit of ownership in that. Um, they're much more aware of their self-esteem or lack of self-esteem. So they become kind of sassy, and they know what they like. Um, they're also very, very peer-oriented. And so they don't want to look foolish in front of their peers. So if you go to a school or you go to a neighborhood where other peers may be there, we want to make sure that we um, are addressing this the best way we can so that they don't uh, feel embarrassed in front of their friends. Okay, Adolescent is 13 to 18 years old. And if you remember being back this age, it's horrific, the emotional war that goes on in their heads is tremendous. Um, they grow rapid. There's a two to three growth spurt that happens in here, a lot more with boys than girls. Um, but you may see kids and they may become, this growth spurt may become painful. Sometimes it happens younger too, but oftentimes in boys, you may see these boys sprout up uh, five, six, seven, eight inches in one year. Um, that brings on a whole psychological process because, you know, these kids are kind of fit. They're not kids, but they're not adults, but they want to be adults, but they really don't know how to be an adult. They're kind of in that in-between stage. So a lot of um, psychological and emotional issues happen with these kids. And then you add in the sexual maturity or immaturity. Um, unfortunately, in today's society, a lot of these kids in this age, particularly even the younger part of this age, 13, 14, are sexually active. So although they physically can be sexually active, um, emotionally, probably not quite ready for that. And do they actually really understand the consequences that go along with that is something that you have to look at on an individual basis. Okay, So they are striving for independence. Um, again, we talked about the peer pressure that's huge, and their body image is huge, um, especially with today's um, social presence on the uh, media, uh, Facebook, all of that, movies, YouTube, all of that stuff. 
um, society puts out there a body image that is acceptable or, or uh, oh, I don't know what I want to say here, or desired, I guess, a desired body image. And, and truly very few of us can actually achieve that. I actually read an article here a few years ago about the gentleman that invented the Barbie doll. And he invented the doll and then sold it to Mattel for production. And later on he said, had he known the impact that that Barbie doll would have had on young kids, he never would have sold the patent and he never would have manufactured the doll. Um, because if you look at Barbie, um, I think in order to have a body like Barbie, um, if you look at the measurements and the proportions, you'd have to be like seven foot seven and weigh 103 pounds or some crazy thing. Um, but yeah, Barbie is putting an image into our children's minds of this is what you look like when you get bigger. And when we don't look like that when we get bigger, which none of us do, we think there's something wrong with us. Um, so, you know, they're very concerned about that. These kids can be very prone to self-destructive behavior. Um, and the more my daughter has foster kids, and we've been uh, blessed and cursed <laughs> to be able to help take, help take care of some of these kids. Um, it's amazing the horrible things that they do to themselves just out of a desire to deal with life. So um, we do have to watch for that. We do have to watch nowadays for suicidal tendencies in our adolescents, as well as eating disorders. Uh, those are becoming very prevalent, both in males and females. So these kids, as they're moving through this adolescent stage, are developing their own personal code of ethics. And this is going to be pulled from people that are influential in their lives, parents, teachers, peers, friends, um, pastors, if they, if they have a church home. And so they're kind of putting all these pieces together and trying to decide who they are and what they stand for. Now, a lot of adolescents are injured because they are risk takers. They are still at that age that they believe they are immortal. The concept of dying is not real to them. I mean, they know old people die and they get that, but the concept that they possibly themselves could die doesn't exist. So um, they're very okay with taking these big risks and thinking there will be no consequences. Um, these kids really probably aren't going to be very open about telling you what happened if there's an accident that happens. Um, but sometimes if you sit down and explain to them, I use it all the time, you know, I am not a cop. I'm only here to help you. So if you be really honest with me, I can make sure that we get you the very best care and get you in the best situation that we can and kind of explain to them sometimes put it out and you know if you're not honest with me we may miss something and you or your friend could die um, and if that's remotely true that's a good tool to use because uh, it does make them kind of think about their consequences then okay early adulthood 19 to 40, these are people in their career years, there's people that are starting family, starting a new career, and really launching their life as an adult. Okay, uh, Their lifelong habits are starting to form. This is when people typically reach their peak physical condition. Okay, I reached mine about 19 years old and peaked about 20. So, um, they're, they're in good shape. For the most part, they're very healthy, okay? but they do have a lot of stress. They have the stress of a new job, stress of maybe two or three jobs trying to make ends meet. They've got a new family, babies, kids, bills, um, trying to buy a new home, trying to keep their car running. You've all been there, you understand, or you will soon. They're also trying to learn how to make marriages work and relationships and divorces um, they're trying to learn how to raise kids. It's easy for the kids to be, you know, we understand that kids grow up and stuff, but what we don't understand often is this is the first time these parents have been parents, so they're learning how to do this right along with the kids learning how to grow up. Um, and 
accidents in these in this age group is the leading cause of death. So whether that's drinking and driving, whether it's texting and driving, whether it's um, doing things when they're too tired, um, and typically these these people are trying to get the most out of life. So they're they're doing a little more adventurous things than they could as teenagers because now they can actually sign their own consent form, and you know they can bungee jump and rip cord and parasail and dive with sharks and all that good stuff. Okay. Middle adulthood is kind of that downhill side, 40 to 60 or 41 to 60 years old. Um, they're still active. They're still, for the most part, very healthy. Um, about this time, you start to see some vision changes in them. I know when I got to be about 42, I couldn't thread a needle all the time. Sometimes I could see it fine. Other times I couldn't. Um, so I had to start wearing the infamous cheater glasses or old lady glasses. Um, to just help with that vision. Sometimes you start seeing people with cancer show up, uh, heart disease starts to develop, and weight control becomes more difficult in this uh, time of life because your metabolism slows down, but generally your appetite does not. So uh, it's kind of a learning curve, and what used to work to lose weight doesn't anymore. You also have parents that are... Uh, or people that are going through the empty nest syndrome. Uh, the kids are growing up and they're leaving home. So I know personally, I had two kids. I homeschooled them. They were with me all the time. And when they left for college, wow, what a life change. And I, though, I was excited for them to go out and be productive and successful. My house was pretty darn empty. And Although I thought I was a relatively stable person, that really was a difficult thing to deal with. The other thing that they're doing is starting to care for their elderly parents who are now coming kind of towards the end stages of their life and may have medical issues, uh, cardiac issues, cancer, those types of things, hospice care, um, or just can't really take care of themselves. So they've got to have some help driving, moving, um, cooking for themselves, paying their bills, that type of thing. So lots kind of going on in the middle adulthood, losing your kids, becoming the caretaker. And then late adulthood is 61 and older. Um, these look very young and healthy late adults. Um, we're not all so blessed to be like this. Um, our body systems start to be less efficient. Our lungs don't expand quite like they used to. Our muscles are a little weak. Our spine is starting, our discs in our spine are starting to shrink up just a little bit. We become a little shorter. Uh, for some women, we become our bones become a little more brittle. Our muscles certainly become weaker. Um, our bodies, for the most part, kind of dehydrate. And so, you know, our kidneys don't work like they used to. All that stuff is just kind of starting to take a downhill side. Now, if you add that with things like diabetes or muscular sclerosis or any of those things, that's only going to compound it. Um, so we're starting to think here in the later years about our living environment. How long can we live out on the farm by ourselves? So we need to think about moving to town. Um, what happens when we get later in life and we have to think about uh, what can we do because we really can't take care of ourselves? Um, you know, we can't drive anymore and... And we're starting to fall, and it's maybe not safe to stay at home by myself anymore because if I fall, I can't get up. Um, so the thought of giving up your independence is huge, and it's terrifying for a lot of people. Uh, they start to question their self-worth. You know, they they start to become, in their minds, a burden to other people, a burden to their family, a burden to society. Uh, generally, in this stage of life, they lose their income. So the income that they had as a working person goes away, and they now have to live on a fixed income. Uh, for some of us, that's that's much smaller income than others, but it's still um, fearful because what if the cost of living keeps going up and I still have only this much money to spend? And then they have to start thinking about that process of death and dying. Um, much like our younger kids, they know it's a reality. They've watched a lot of friends and family pass away ahead of them, and they know it's coming. And for the most part, 
given time and um, patience, people prior to the end of their life kind of come to grips with that, and it's an okay thing, but uh, it's a struggle getting there sometimes. Okay. So if I can say anything, I would say become familiar with the changes that are going to happen. Absolutely get you a, a cheat sheet, and we'll talk a little bit about this in class, but get you something that's going to help you understand what is normal, whether it's just a set of normal vital signs um, or expectations of different age groups and understand what the normal is for the patient that you're taking care of. Put that cheat sheet or that resource that you have in a place where you can look at it on the way to the call. So when you walk in the door, you know what should be normal about this patient. Um, it's, a, it's a little time consuming when you're trying to evaluate your patient and look up your resources at the same time. Now that being said, the, the PowerPoint here did not really address it, but I do want to make, um, make a point here. When you're assessing a kid, um, that's kind of a tough thing to do because kids, kids don't always present like adults. They're not little adults. They're, they're entirely different creatures. Their body works differently. Their brains work differently. So um, we want to look at them from across the room. Okay, and we're going to talk about this a little more when we get to pediatrics, but we're going to start our assessment when they're still sitting in mom's laps or they're still in their normal environment and see, are they breathing? Are they crying? Are they scared? Are they looking at us? And when you walk in, for the most part, uh, with exception being, you know, infants, a stranger walks in the room dressed as funny as you're going to be dressed as an EMT. Kids should be a little bit leery of you. So if you walk in a room and a kid really doesn't care if you're there or not, that's kind of a big red flag. Um, when we approach our kids to start our assessment, if the kid is conscious um, or looking at us and responding to us, we want to start at the feet and go up. Now, typically when we do an assessment, and you'll learn this, we're going to start at the head and go down. We'll look at the important parts first. But with these kids, we want to establish that trust level. So we want to start at the feet and typically I reach out and just pinch their toes or tickle the bottom of their foot and try and get them to trust me or, you know, I try and get them to smile at me. If they'll smile at me, I, I can go a long way with that. But do something that's very non-threatening and the feet are very non-threatening. And then as you build that trust, move up, listen to their lungs, look at their eyes, head, all of that good stuff. Um, same thing with our adults. Um, as they get older... They're not all deaf, okay? They're not all blind. So when you walk into an older patient's room, don't yell at them. Talk in your normal tone of voice. If they can't hear you, they will tell you, and then you can speak up. Uh, but we don't want to walk in and, you know, Mrs. Jones, um, scream at them because that's really kind of insulting. Um, we also want to treat them with respect. So my... My code of ethics with these guys is I address them as Mr. or Mrs., whatever their last name is, until they tell me differently. So keep that in mind and read through your chapter. And I've enjoyed spending this time with you. So we will talk to you soon. Have a great class.